Hello everyone, this is the second video of the cell signaling series. In the previous video, we have discussed about main modes of cell signaling, the chemical communication that occurs by hormones and neurotransmitters, and electrical communication that occurs through gap junctions. We already discussed about the components of cell signaling, for example, ligand, that acts as the stimulus, the receptor, the, basically the protein with which the ligand binds, the intracellular signaling proteins that helps in multiplication or rather amplification and relaying of the cell signal and the effector proteins that ultimately brings the change within the cell or outside the cell, ultimately affecting the cellular physiology and um, all other physiological response. There are different types of signaling and uh, we al already discussed this in the previous video, the juxtacrine, paracrine, endocrine, autocrine and synaptic signal. In this video, we are going to discuss about different switches in cell signaling. The first switch is basically the change in the phosphorylation and dephosphorylation status of a protein. When a signal arrives in a cell, that signal specifically activates a group of protein, which is known as protein kinase. Now, protein kinases are, are a group of enzymes that transfers phosphorus group A onto other proteins and activates them. Here, the phosphorus group that is being transferred to the target protein is basically transferred on the serine or threonine amino acids. Now, there are different groups of protein kinases which are activated in response to specific signaling pathways. For example, protein kinase A is activated in GPCR-mediated CAM signaling pathway. Protein kinase C is activated in response of calcium. Protein kinase B is activated in RTK signaling. Again, after that, the phosphorylated state of the protein, that is of the target protein, is active state. And this phosphorylated active protein then carries out specific function. After some time, the protein phosphatase cleaves off the phosphate group from the active protein, again reverting the active state in the inactive form. The next type of switch seen in case of cell signaling is the GDP-GTP exchange of specific proteins. Now, in a cell, there are different proteins which are known as G proteins that can bind with either GDP or GTP. And the fact that whether it's bound with the GDP or GTP, it determines if the protein is in its active form or in its inactive form. When the protein is bound with GDP, it is in its inactive form. And when the protein is bound with GTP, it is in its active form. On arrival of specific signal, the GTP, GDP exchange occurs and the protein which was previously bound with GDP is now bound with GTP. Now this GTP bound state of the protein is active state which carries out specific function. After some time, the GT GTP hydrolysis occurs and the last gamma phosphate of the GTP is cleaved off and again the GDP bound inactive state of the protein is restored, rendering the inactivation of the protein. GTP and GDP exchange and change in phosphorylation status activates or inactivates protein to create different behaviors or it changes the transcriptome profiling of the cell initiating or inhibiting new transcription of new gene. Now, the effect of this kind of signaling is diverse. For example, uh, in the diagram, the green protein is an inactive transcription regulator which is bound with an inhibitor protein. On arrival of a specific signal, the red colored protein kinase is activate, activated that phosphorylates the yellow colored inhibitor protein. On phosphorylation, the conformational change of the inhibitor protein releases the transcription regulator. Now, when the transcription regulator was sequestered by the inhibitor protein, it was inactivated. After arrival of the signal and phosphorylation of the inhibitor protein, when the transcription regulator is no longer bound with the inhibitor protein, it becomes activated, it then translocated in the nucleus and then initiates the transcription of specific genes, initiating signal-specific gene expression. That is, if we see the right panel or the 
diagram on right side on arrival of specific signal specific protein kinases are activated that inhibit specific inhibitor protein in turn activating specific transcription regulators resulting in signal specific gene expression the next one is there are a group of proteins that helps in this gdp gtp exchange on arrival of a specific signal a group of proteins are activated which are guanine nucleotide exchange factors now by this name it is evident that these guanine nucleotide exchange factors they facilitate the exchange of gdp with gtp the g protein which was previously bound with gdp in association with this gefs this gdp protein is now replaced by gtp now this gtp bound g protein is in its active form and then facilitates some specific function after some time the gap or gtp as activating factors are activated within the cell they are not specifically activated but they are previously present in the cell and after some time the activity of this gtps activating factors are increased on the gtp of the g protein now this gaps or gtps activating factors they cleave the last gamma phosphate and then again the gdp bound state of the g protein which is basically the inactive form is restored inactivating the entire response now this gtp bound g protein is used in various different type of cell signaling for example as you can see cyclic amp signaling inositol dac signaling nap kinase pathway pld signaling etc when a signal comes the signal acts in two different ways one it changes the phosphorylation or dephosphorylation state of proteins present in the cytoplasm or the gtp gtp bound state of the proteins present in the cytoplasm itself and this change in the activity of the protein directly alters other cytoplasmic protein functions in the cell now this altered functions regulates the cell behavior and cellular physiology this is the fast response that does not involves the nucleus and new gene expression rather it involves only the cytoplasmic proteins but another type of signal is that or another type of uh, way to execute a particular signal is that when a signal arrives it it activates specific transcription regulators and those transcription regulators are then translocated into the nucleus initiates the transcription of specific genes the rna or the corresponding rna is formed the rna then translocated or gets translocated in the cytoplasm from the nucleus then the protein synthesis occurs and those newly formed proteins that executes particular functions for example alter cytoplasmic machinery now this pathway is known as nuclear pathway and this pathway which involves the expression or transcription of new genes on arrival of a particular signal this is a relatively slow response so the response that involves only the pre existing cytosolic proteins is comparatively fast and the response that involves the expression or transcription of a new gene is comparatively slow some signaling systems generate both rapid and slow response as shown here allowing the cell to respond quickly to a signal while simultaneously initiating a more long term persistent response and this same is seen in case of developmental biology the next is signaling loop and effect of a signal it is seen that when a particular signaling kinase is activated in response to a particular signal as shown in the figure the signaling kinase is s and uh, it phosphorylates the protein e and hence the it activates the protein e now this activated e kinase phosphorylates other inactive e proteins and this in turn generates a positive feedback loops and over a specific time period more and more inactive e proteins will be activated both by the signal kinase s and the activated e kinase now this on a longer time scale creates a specific response that can that could be explained by this graphical representation
Now on x axis is the time scale and in y axis is the extent to which the response is generated. Now after the signal is applied, the positive in the, the, the rise in the graph basically shows that the proteins or the response that is generated in a cell. Even after withdrawal of the signal, see the response is almost steady. This is seen in case of the positive feedback loop. Even after withdrawal of the signal, the altered cellular physiology is not getting faded away. Rather, it, for a certain period of time, it is stable. But another feedback loop is, is seen, which is known as the negative feedback loop, where the signal kinase S is present that activates the inactive E protein by phosphorylating it. The phosphorylate E protein is the active state. Now this phosphorylated E which is active then phosphorylates I protein which actually helps in the dephosphorylation of the activated E kinase itself and inactivates the entire signaling pathway. Now this entire negative feedback loop could be, can, uh, you know, we can explain it by this graphical representation. When the signal arrives, first the E protein is activated and after activation, it activates I protein, which again inactivates the E protein. On inactivation, the concentration of activated I protein decreases in the cell, again resulting in the activation of E protein. So, over a time, until which phase the signal is present, this altered activity or negative feedback loop present in the cell will create an oscillating pattern of proteins within the cell generating an oscillatory pattern in the cell physiology itself. This is seen in case of negative feedback loop. Now, uh, this is a basic graph where no feedback is present. The signal is arrived we can see the rise in the response and again when the signal is withdrawn the response the response is faded away now three different curves are seen one is all or none another one is hyperbolic and another one is sigmoidal basically in all or none it is seen that when a signal arrives then there are two different uh, results that could be there. One, the cell will show an altered physiology. Two, the cell will not show any altered physiology. There is nothing in between. So this kind of response is known as all or none, which is seen in case of synaptic transmission. If the voltage exceeds a particular threshold level, then the synaptic impulse will be generated. And if that does not exceed the threshold level, no synaptic impulse, that is no depolarization will be seen. Another one is hyperbolic and another one is sigmoidal. All or none in is seen basically in case of positive feedback loop. Sigmoidal is seen in case of basically negative feedback loop, whereas in case of the control where no feedback is present, the hyperbolic or the gradual expression or gradual increase in the signal is seen until, which, until the time by which the signal is present. Now, desensitization of signaling pathways. Now, when a signal arrives, a cell responses by altering its physiology in proteomic level, transcriptomic level. Now, a cell signal cannot perceive for an indefinite time period. Rather, the cell opts different mechanism for signal desensitization. And to minimize the effect of signaling after some time, which are as follows. The first is when a ligand binds with the receptor after some time, the ligand receptor complex is internalized by endocytosis and it forms an endosome. Within the endosome, the ligand, which is the stimulus, detaches itself from the receptor and after some time, the ligand is destroyed and the receptor is again translocated in the cell surface. The second one is in which the endosome fuses with the lysosome and in that lysosome, both the ligand 
and the receptor they are destroyed this is known as receptor down regulation because this process helps in decreasing the concentration of the receptor onto the cell surface the third one is where the signal uh, or the intracellular signaling proteins they release the signal in a way that activates other protein or directly inhibits the major intracellular signaling pathways or intracellular signaling proteins which are involved in the pathway uh, now it, it it could be direct or it can involve a set of inhibitory proteins very specific to that particular signaling pathway this four different modes first one receptor sequestering second one receptor down regulation third one inactivation of the signaling pathway itself by the sig uh, intracellular signaling proteins and fourth production of inhibitory proteins these four different modes are used in the desensitization of signaling pathways there are a large number of signaling pathways that we can see but in in general way we can classify them in different types the first one that that happens by the g protein coupled receptor there is a receptor that is present on the cell surface this receptor is basically a uh, seven transmembrane protein seven pass transmembrane protein that has a ligand binding site on the extracellular surface and the intracellular cytosolic phase or the cytosolic loops are connected with another g protein and on arrival of a specific signal the gpcr is activated generate and results in the generation of a particular signal which in turn activates other set of proteins that facilitates the cytoplasmic response and the nuclear gene expression the second one is uh, the cytokine receptors basically the major difference between the gpcr and cytokine is that the in in, in gpcr uh, the set of proteins that are activated they are both they, they can carry out both the cytosolic response and the nuclear gene expression response and they involve multiple sets of relaying proteins and amplifying proteins when we will discuss the gpcr we will see how many types of amplifying and multiplication and relaying proteins are used in case of the cytokine proteins the diversity of the proteins which are used as the amplification or the relaying proteins are comparatively less than that to the gpcr also these cytokine receptors they basically uh, are seen uh, in a specific signaling pathway that we know as the jackstack signaling pathway the third one is the receptor tyrosine kinase now in this two diagram the cytokine receptor and the receptor tyrosine kinase the receptor and the expression or the signaling is basically same but the major difference between the cytokine receptor and the receptor tyrosine kinase is that in cytokine receptors the kinase activity is not intrinsic to that of the receptor that is other set of proteins are recruited to the receptor on arrival of a particular signal to initiate the uh, further relaying of the signal into the cell but the kinase activity in case of the receptor tyrosine kinase is intrinsic to the receptor and the receptor itself has the ability to phosphorylate other receptors and initiate the signaling uh, the fourth one is the tgf beta pathway where the signal binds with the receptor and the receptor itself has the intrinsic kinase activity now as evident by the diagram the rtk or the receptor tyrosine kinase and the tgf beta pathway in both of them the intrinsic kinase activity is present in the receptors but the major difference between the rtk and tgf beta is that in rtk or receptor tyrosine kinase the, the kinase activity by the kinase activity the receptor phosphorylates on specific tyrosine amino acid residues of the target proteins but in case of the tgf beta receptors they phosphorylate on serine or threonine residues of specific target proteins also when we will see the mechanism of these two different uh, signaling pathways we will see that in tgf beta the proteins which are involved they are known as smad proteins which are on phosphorylation uh, they are activated and activated span, uh, smad proteins on complex on forming complex with other smad proteins are translocated in the nucleus and then they initiate the transcription of specific genes the next one is the hedgehog signaling pathway where two different sets of receptors are present on the cell membrane on absence of the cell signal receptor 1 which has a specific name inhibits the receptor 2 and no signaling pathway activation is seen 
On arrival of a specific signal, the receptor 1 is inactivated and can no longer inhibit receptor 2. And this receptor 2 then helps in the activation of specific signaling pathway within the cell. We will discuss hedgehog signaling and the names of these two receptors and their functioning in detailing when we will do hedgehog signaling. Then comes the wind signaling pathway. Now, hedgehog signaling pathway and wind signaling pathway mechanistically are same, but the major difference in wind and hedgehog is that in hedgehog signaling pathway, two different classes of receptors are used. In case of the wind signaling pathway, only single receptor is used. In wind signaling pathway, in presence of the ligand, the signaling pathway is switched on and it initiates specific cell altering or cellular physiological responses in absence of the ligand that is switched off. The last one is basically the notch receptor or the notch delta signaling pathway where the ligand is expressed on the cell membrane of a cell and the receptor is present on another cell membrane but both of these two cells need to come near each other for initiating the cell signaling. If we recall the previous video in which we discussed juxtacrine cell signaling, this notch receptor is an example of juxtacrine or contact dependent cell signaling where the ligand is not secreted out of the cell, rather is expressed on or ex expressed as one of the transmembrane proteins on a particular cell membrane and then it binds with another transmembrane protein which is basically the receptor present in another cell membrane. That was all for today. Thank you.